welcome students to the Chesterton High School Congressional Candidate Forum hosted by the CHS Social Studies Department. My name is Sid Augustine, president and founder of the CHS Young Democrats and member of the class of 2020 and moderator of this forum. On behalf of the CHS community, I would like to thank the candidates of District 1 for taking the time out of their busy campaign schedules to be here with us today to discuss their platforms and answer a few questions of the senior class submitted prior to today. I would also like to thank CHS administrators, including Principal uh, Martinson and social studies teachers, including Ms. Servos and Mr. Nallenwag, as well as CHS Dem Secretary Gianna Galante and Vice President uh, Savannah Lee in their help organizing today's forum. The goal of today's forum is to provide an opportunity for students to hear about the domestic, national, and international policies that are important to the platforms of our candidates as they run for office. Not only will this inform our decisions this November as we vote for the first time as seniors, but it will help us to become aware of the issues that are important to our region. I will begin by opening the forum to the candidates who will each deliver a three-minute speech to introduce us to, their, to uh, who they are, including any relevant background and the platform that they feel makes them the best choice for District 1 representative. Following this part of the forum, each candidate will field two questions each that will, that will have been pre-submitted by CHS students. Without delay, I introduce to you the candidates. Let's begin with left to right and proceed uh, from left to right. Uh, so first, uh, Mr. Bergeron. Hello. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, thank you for hosting this. My name is Dion Bergeron. Uh, I'm a 46-year-old father of five children. I was a over-the-road truck driver for about a decade. I drove a million miles. I have seen one end of this country to the other, 48 out of 50 states. I've been to Canada. I've been to Mexico. I've been through border crossings. I've been through border security. After that, I was a correctional officer at Indiana State Prison right there in Michigan City, the maximum security prison. Uh, I did that for seven years. I worked almost every post you can think of. Some of the most critical areas that we need to focus on this election is health care. That's all we hear on the news anymore, Medicare for all versus private health care. Um, there seems to be a big divide. It's either this or this. The key is there are options that exist that don't completely go one way or the other. If we leave it alone, we know that's not going to work. We have people that are de declaring bankruptcy. 66% of Americans who have declared bankruptcy did so because of medical expenses. That's a huge number. We need to rectify that. There are options out there. They're called deductible security and transparent pricing. It's in use by the country of Singapore, who have some of the healthiest citizens in the world and spend the least countries on their health care system. The state of Indiana and Whole Foods have been using this system for years successfully. We would pay 75% less for our health care. Everyone would be covered. It's a nice middle ground that saves the private health care industry and provides key medical assistance to those who need it. That's really a, my, my number one goal here. Uh, as I said, I don't have any political experience, but we need regular Americans to stand up, run for office, and I'm so glad to see all of you here getting involved in the political process. You are the next generation. Many of you hopefully will run for office. Get involved. Look up each candidate. Learn about them. It's the information age. There's no reason not to learn. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, wasn't too long that I was sitting where you were sitting. I think I'm the closest in age to you on this um, stage. Uh, my name is Melissa Borum, and I am running for the first um, congressional district. So, you know, you're never too young to get involved. Um, I have worked on family campaigns my entire life, but I really got involved for myself working for um, President Barack Obama when I was a sophomore in college. And then I worked um, and went on to work for the Indiana General Assembly when I was a junior in college. 
And then I went back to school, I graduated, and then I went and worked for one of the largest law firms in Indianapolis in their public affairs group. So still very closely related to politics. And then I went to law school, I went to Balpo Law School, and I worked for Congressman Pete Visklowski. I worked for the House Committee on Appropriations, and I also worked for U.S. Senator Dick Durbin. So every part of my life is just a compound of things put together. So now I manage government affairs for a global aviation company that's headquartered in Illinois. And I've been so fortunate to actually get legislation signed by the President of the United States of America at 30 years old. That's amazing. So don't ever let anyone tell you that you're too young to get involved or you're too young to change the world because you're not. And I think that it is so amazing that you all are here today to hear from us, to hear about national issues. I don't think that I had as much courage or, or knowledge that you all had at your age. And so it's still very possible that you can be whatever you want to be and do whatever you want to do. We live in the greatest country alive and it's possible. So please don't let anyone deter you from who you want to be in, in life. I currently sit on the board for um, North Shore Health Centers. I see that my questions um, revolve around health care and I think that everyone deserves a right to have quality health care. Everyone deserves a right to have, that is a fundamental right. Everyone deserves to have that. I also want to focus on diversifying our economy. Growing up in Northwest Indiana, it seems like we only have one job and that's to go to the meals. Well, what about the other jobs that support the meal? Or what about other jobs that may be able to take us to Chicago? Those are the type of opportunities I would like to bring to Northwest Indiana, especially at the Gary Airport. I would also like to focus on trades and apprenticeship programs. You don't have to go to law school to be somebody. You don't have to go to med school to be somebody. You can learn a transferable trade, live here, work here, and play here, and be just as... I'm sorry. Thank you, candidate. Oh, we'll now oh, pass no. on the mic. <laughs> no. Oh, she told me to stop? Yeah, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just, wait, let's start talking. Wait. Wait. They told me five minutes. I had to cut it down to three. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for leaving this candidate forum. It's an honor to be here speaking to what I see as the future. A candidate's platform is important, but a candidate's philosophy is very important because it guides us in times of ambiguity. For me, the meaning of life is for one generation to be a bridge to the future for the next generation. And in our society, the tendency has always been to sacrifice today so that tomorrow could be better. But our tendency to sacrifice has been undone by the prevailing economic ideology of neoliberalism and its demands for deregulation, privatization, and quality profit. First and foremost, we have a crisis of wealth and income inequality. Economic inequality causes tremendous suffering for millions of Americans every day and it has severely damaged our democracy. The super rich can afford to spend loads of money to increase their control of our political agenda through campaign contributions and lobbying. The climate crisis has been caused by corporations lobbying for unregulated carbon emissions. The same corporate influence has led to a crisis in healthcare where corporations lobby politicians to fight against universal healthcare. Many congressmen Congress persons make laws using the Ames model of decision making. Anecdote, ideology, myth, suspicion, and as of late, conspiracies. In stark contrast to that, progressives like myself value the scientific method. I believe that science should guide our political policies. I also believe that all Americans have a right to a good job, a right to affordable and decent housing, a right to affordable and comprehensive health care, a right to clean air, clean water, and clean soil. I believe in a strong EPA. I believe in immune protections and expansion. I believe that everyone 16 and older should be able to vote on a paper in their neighborhood. As I listened to the crescendo of news pundits 
Heading into Super Tuesday, I kept hearing all kinds of fear about Bernie Sanders becoming president. And all I could wonder was how could Americans be more afraid of Bernie Sanders than they are of the same old political party leaders who have delivered us into the crises that we face today. I do not believe that there's an acceptable halfway point to solutions like 0% carbon emissions by 2050, or there's no acceptable halfway point about how many Americans should be covered by health care. What is the core problem that we are dealing with? The philosophical giant of neoliberalism is Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand's philosophy is what she called the virtue of selfishness. Neoliberal leaders have extolled Ayn Rand's philosophy for decades. Alan Greenspan, Milton Friedman, Ronald Reagan, Paul Ryan, and our president. Progressives are opposite of this. Progressives know that what made, what made America great is... Thank you, Mr. Costello. Thank you, and I'll move on to the next candidate. Uh, I am Ryan Flora. I am a progressive Democrat running to be your next congressman. Um, as far as my platform goes, you won't find a whole lot of difference in between what I believe in and what Bernie Sanders believes in. Um, and something happened last night uh, that I think you know you may or may not have paid very close attention to, but millions of people over the age of 45 came out last night and they declared something. That's that they don't really care much about you. They think they know better. They don't think you're going to come out and vote. Right? You have the power to become one of the most powerful voting blocks in the history of this country if you go out and vote. But they think you're full of crap. They don't think you'll do it. So it's my challenge to you to stand up to people who don't think you're going to take part in democracy, who don't think you're going to care to have a voice. Get out and vote. Make a difference. You know, it's really cool being back in high school. Uh, I've worked as a teacher, and I really enjoyed my own high school experience. Uh, it's kind of crazy to me to know that uh, I assume many of you were probably born in 2002. Uh, that year was an interesting year for me. It was when I was on the first ever episode of American Idol. Uh, I, I was actually one of the first people to ever... ...money at all. You won't enjoy it. Just, you know, do whatever you don't search Ryan for our American Idol on Google. It's don't do it. Um, <laughs> That being said, uh, you know, interestingly enough, I graduated in 1998. Uh, that might not seem significant to you, but it is actually significant because it was in 1999 that a little thing happened called the Columbine Massacre. So I was actually the last generation in the United States of America to graduate high school without ever having to think about the idea of a mass shooting happening in my high school. I was a freshman in college. Uh, I actually didn't stick with college. I couldn't afford it. I didn't want to take out student loans. And I thought maybe I could be a rock star. And Well, I did get on American Idol, so I, I met some of my goals with that. But uh, I, I didn't end up going to college until I was in my mid-20s. And I bring that up because I, I want you to realize if you decide not to enroll in college in the fall, it's never too late, right? Maybe you're not ready this year, but you might be ready later. So whatever you do, don't give up on yourself. Okay, college is always an option, and it, it worked out really great for me uh, going in my mid-20s because I was ready and I got the most out of it. I was a captain of my mock trial team. I was a tutor for the political science department, a resident assistant. Uh, I really enjoyed the system. I got a great education. Um, but my main message to you here today is, as I said, take hold of your power because politicians are going to notice if enough of you vote to know that you can make a difference. Thank you, Mr. Farrar. Thank you. Hi there. My name is Sabrina Hake. Hake rhymes with cake. I did not like high school. I'll own that first up. I didn't know who the heck I was. I went from being a stoner to a cheerleader and all over the place. Didn't know who I was. I, I own that because you don't always know who you're going to be. I've been a trial lawyer for the last 15 years. About 10 years before that, I was general counsel of uh, a, an international manufacturer. I lucked into that job. I'll own that too. The reason I got that gig is because I studied in China, and then I studied in London, and I studied the commercial codes of those two respective uh, countries. And um, at that time, the common market was emerging. So I became general counsel and traveled all over the world negotiating licensing agreements. 
And um, I did not become a lawyer for any lofty reason. I became a lawyer because I was tired of waiting tables. I'll own that too. So I have been a lawyer for many years now, and I decided to run for Congress with a, a deep passion to try to do something about climate change. Climate change to me is such a big issue, and I don't feel like we have five years or even two years to talk about it. I feel like we need to hit it right now. And I'm so thankful that, to people like Sid Augustine here who got the, the climate action uh, resolution passed in Chesterton, which is so cool, and uh, to J Jelana Jelante for putting this on. It means that young people are aware of what's going on. Climate is huge, and we can't take little bites of it. The really heavy lift in fighting climate change is going to be heavy industry. And I'm trying to put together, I've got a plan backed up by bi bipartisan engineers reports to help convert heavy industry, because if we don't do that, it won't be enough. So we've got to start converting to renewable energy with all of our heavy industry sectors, and uh, we're going to have to pay for it. We're just going to have to swallow that pill, and we can start by stop subsidizing fossil fuels and put that money into renewable energy. So the money is there. We just need the political will. I'm also concerned about the income disparity. Our region has a huge income disparity. Hammond, Gary, and East Chicago have uh, incomes that are 18, 17, 14,000 per capita. The wealthier areas in our district are four and five times that. That's not sustainable and it's not just. Some of the green energy jobs, if you've, any of you have read the green, the green New Deal, it's only about 15 pages. It's more aspirational, mine's more specific, but it's, it's, it's taken off of that. Those are, that is a great way to close our income gap. I'm also concerned about education. I also think marijuana should be legalized as a matter of economic common sense. $10 million a month is what Illinois is, is earning. Um, and I think that's crazy. The last thing is something you won't see on anyone else's platform. I've been an animal activist for years. I cannot stand when people get a dog and leave that dog on a chain 24-7, regardless of the temperature. I believe that we, as a nation, can do better. We've socialized dogs. We shouldn't do that to them. Maybe it doesn't belong on my platform, but I'm not going to stop talking about it because it's in my heart. Again, Sabrina Hake, GoSabrina.com. You'll see more than you ever wanted to see, so please check it out, GoSabrina.com. Thanks. I'm Mon Hanley. I'm a Republican candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives in Northwest Indiana's first congressional district. I grew up in Crown Point, graduated from Maryville High School, and after serving in the U.S. Army, I graduated from Purdue on a GI Bill. I believe I can lead this region into a period of growth and prosperity. My congressional tenure will focus on creating a culture of entrepreneurship, delivering school choice and access to higher ed, ensuring equity for everyone, and fighting for the environment every day. I invented a product called Pit Moss. It's an environmentally safe growing medium for plants that was designed to pre preserve and protect wetlands the world over. These unique wetlands make up only 3% of the Earth's land surface, and yet they sequester a third of all of our soil carbons. I thought it was insane that we were actually ditching, draining, and dredging these wetlands to fill flower pots so your grandparents, your parents, you yourself can grow geraniums and petunias. It's absolutely insane. So I invented the product, and I worked for the last 20 years to commercialize that product. Some of you, I wasn't on Idle, but some of you may have seen investor Mark Cuban invest in my company on Shark Tank. A son's duty brought me back to this region, and I became the sole caregiver for my father who was suffering from dementia. And it was really, truly my honor and privilege to take care of him until his passing. And being back in the region, I became aware of what Chancellor Tom Kean was doing at Purdue Northwest. He appointed me as the associate director and then the entrepreneur in residence of the Commercialization and Manufacturing Excellence Center. And through the programs I've created, I am now trying to become the person that I needed to mentor me when I was your age so that I could commercialize my product faster. Through my programs, we've seen a marked increase in the number of patents being filed for area innovators. And we've seen funding come in for those startups from private, state, 
and federal sources. I sincerely want to thank you for your time. And if you're an innovator yourself, check out the PNW Big Sell. We're giving away $10,000 this year to the top program that's presented. So thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is uh, Jim Harper. I'm a Democratic candidate for Congress. I have not been on American Idol or Shark Tank, although I did appear on WDSO in 2016. So just saying you might want to hit the archives. Um, I am from Valparaiso. I am, I am an attorney. Um, I became an attorney because I am passionate about fighting for everybody in my community. That's why after I went to IU, graduated from Georgetown University Law School, worked for a federal judge, I moved to New Orleans, Louisiana, and worked as a public defender in one of the most underfunded, understaffed public defender's offices in the country. It's also why I co-founded a national nonprofit law firm called the Veterans Legal Advocacy Group that serves and represents our disabled veterans when they're fighting with the federal government for the benefits that they are entitled to. It's why when I moved back up to Northwest Indiana about five or six years ago, I joined the board of a nonprofit in Valparaiso that provides early childhood education to Porter County families. I am running for Congress for a couple of reasons, but first and foremost, because I believe that we have really big problems in this country and that the old political leadership has not served not only this country well, but certainly has not served your generation well from an economy that is unfair, that is rigged against middle-class Americans, to a climate that is in crisis, to a president who is out of control and who is undermining our democratic values day in and day out, to a gun violence problem that our leaders have lacked the moral courage to address. I believe that we need bold, progressive action in Washington, D.C. to address the issues for this whole country, but certainly to address the issues for this generation. That's why I support policies that will make sure that our economy is more fair for you all as you join the workforce. It is simply immoral that at a time in this country when the stock market is at the absolute highest, the income inequality in this country is at the greatest. It's why I would repeal the Trump, ta Trump tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans and invest them in things that help you, like public schools and infrastructure. It's why I believe we need a Green New Deal to address the climate crisis, to get this country to carbon neutrality by 2030 and our world to carbon neutrality by 2050. It's why I believe that we have to invest in our public schools. We have to reduce the amount of money and time we spend on testing, invest it in your teachers and in your programs, and make sure that college is affordable for every American. Thank you all. Hi, my name is Tom McDermott. I'm the mayor of Hammond, Indiana. I want to thank Chesterton High School for hosting this event. This is really encouraging to see so many youths interested in what's going on in your congressional district. When I was your age, I wasn't exactly college material. I took a different path to get to where I am right now, and I think it's important for you to know about pathways, because not everybody that's in this auditorium right now is going to go on and excel in college. I was one of them. I joined the Navy right out of high school, became a veteran, uh, served six years on a nuclear fast attack submarine as an electrician and the Navy's diver. I tell you what, I learned a lot about myself when I was underwater serving in the United States Navy. I couldn't wait to get out of the Navy, and I did. And when I got out, I moved to Hammond, Indiana, right across the street from Purdue Calumet, and started attending college there. It was a lot different experience for me going to college as opposed to going to law school. Oh, excuse me, as opposed to going to high school. I was a different student altogether, and I excelled. And when I, I was working full time for NIPSCO at that time, and I was going to college at nights, and when I got accepted to the University of Notre Dame, I went out there, met my wife, and uh, became a lawyer. Convinced my wife, who grew up in Manhattan, convinced her to move back to Northwest Indiana, particularly convinced her to move to Hammond, Indiana, which makes me a dang good salesman, I think. Anyway, we moved there. I opened a law firm after passing the bar, and after doing that, I ran for mayor, three years after moving into the city. I became Hammond's mayor and have served for 16 years as mayor of the city of Hammond. I think it's important because although you're not going to be a mayor of a congressional district, I have the experience to do what it takes to be done for the first congressional district. For instance, as mayor, I often hear on the road, we need more economic development in our region. We more, need more clean energy and tech types of jobs in our region. I've done that. 
Since I've been mayor of Hammond, I brought in $900 million in new economic development to the city of Hammond. The last $100 million that we're getting invested into our city involves a brand new data center that was scheduled to go into Chicago before we intervened. I also invested $300 million into the city of Hammond's infrastructure. Our infrastructure under the streets, our parks, new bike trails, new bridges, $300 million. I've helped send 6,000 students under a college scholarship program called the College Bound Scholarship to college on that scholarship, which is the best thing I'll ever do in public service. Students are a big part of who I am as mayor. I regularly go to Hammond's high schools, middle schools, and elementary schools. I never turn down an opportunity to go in front of the students. I think my time is up. I just want you to, if you want to change Washington, D.C., you do it one person at a time. I think I am the type of person to change. Thank you very much. Go Trojans. <laughs> uh, my name is Wendell Mosby, and I'm running for to be the congressman in the first district. Uh, when I was your age, Uh, ra born and raised in Chicago, a little, for, a little due west of here. But now I currently live in Sherville with my wife, who's a teacher of 12 years, and our six-year-old son. I went to college. To, I went to Iowa State University with $60 in my pocket and a Pell Grant. I did come from parents that were, were, were mainstays in a community that, you know, uh, that could pay for everything for me. I, everything I have had to work for. Worked two to three jobs throughout college. While I was in college, I became involved in the student government. Well, I was a student senator for a few years, and then I ran for student body president. I was also a teenage dad, and my son graduated from the same university I did, Iowa State, last December. I was at 19, and I'm, I'm thankful that he doesn't have any children, and he has a future that I, I worked so hard for him to have. In this district, there are over 184,000 residents that have a high school diploma, I was a community college trustee at Prairie State, and so I think I'm uniquely qualified to understand that college isn't for everybody, and some people just want to go get a certificate, go to trade school, and be able to provide for their families. And so, in addition to that, so one of the things I want to do is, being a, a husband of a teacher, I hear a lot about education. And my wife is saddled with advanced degrees and settled a lot of student debt. And so one of the things I'd like to do, if I'm elected to Congress, is modify the student forgiveness, public service student loan, forgiveness program, where a teacher, regardless if they teach in public school or private school, that their loans will be canceled. Because I, I know there's teachers here working hard, and they deserve that because teachers in this state don't get paid enough for what the job that they do. Secondly, I'd like to create a, have an amendment to the Constitution for, and that every student has, a, has an equal opportunity for a high quality education. I'm teaching in schools in Hammond, Griffin, Gary, East Chicago and they don't look like this school, but they should be afforded the same opportunity that you have here. And I think that it shouldn't be a state to decide who wins and who loses based on their zip codes. And so this, lastly, what I'm running for is because we have somebody in the White House who, who was an embarrassment to this country, and I'm sorry. I have a six-year-old son who says, this man is saying inappropriate things. And if my six-year-old can distinguish between right and wrong and understand that some of the things that doesn't embody the core values of this country. Thank you, I think that we all need we'll to stand up for that. So thank you.
your congressman is working for you. Something that I do every single day representing Hampton, White, Chicago Island, and Munster is I help, be I help people become self-sufficient. Also, what we do is we work on what causes poverty. So education is a key component of that. And very often there's childhood uh, effects or adverse effects or trauma that goes into that. And so one program that we did that went to all the schools, I'm proud of two programs in the high schools that we've done. One is a No More Secrets program that talks about uh, child molestation and how predators push boundaries. And each school in the state of Indiana has to talk about that. It also talks about internet safety, about home safety. A statistic that I know that a lot of adults know is, you know, very often there are predators on the internet. And very often it's very common for high school and middle aged kids to pass naked pictures back and forth. And if you've either seen it or passed it or know someone who's passed it, that puts you in a vulnerable position. And as a congressman, what I want to do is be able to make sure there are laws that are protecting you. We've done that long in school. We also did a 13 Reasons Why Not program because in Indiana, childhood suicide or teen suicide is continuously ranking at high levels. So we empowered young people to be able to understand mental health and the ability to have access to mental health. And more importantly, to reduce the stigma of mental health. And as your congressman, I want you to have access to health care, but more importantly, I want to make sure that you understand that mental health is important. So we talk about the economy and those big words and the steel industry. But I know that you want to be able to breathe fresh air. I want to know you want to have clean water. I want to know if you want me to be able to go to Washington, D.C. and maybe make climate change a priority. I want the women in this class and this school to be able to earn equal amount of money that men make. I have two daughters. I want to make sure that you're not making 75% of what other people are making. So here's what you need to know. I'm an authentic candidate who has worked hard at the ground level for 15 years. I've served veterans, I've served people in vulnerable, uh, vulnerable populations, and I've worked in the school and I've tried to advance programs that advance young people and mental health and your ability to have opportunities. Thank you, I'm Mr. Mr. Murphan. I'm a candidate for U.S. Congress. Thank you. Thank you to all the candidates. Now we will proceed with the question and answer portion of the forum. I will be asking a number of the questions from students that were pre-submitted who expressed that they did not want to read their own questions. And for those who do want to ask their own, there will be a roving microphone that Mr. Blumenthal has uh, when it's your turn and you can ask your question. So first, we'll begin with a question for Mr. Harper. Do you support Medicare for all, and would this policy eliminate private insurance for constituents in Northwest Indiana? I do support Medicare for all. One of the great moral failings we have in this country is that it continues to be a fact that despite some advances over the last several years, 28 million Americans are uninsured. 30% of Americans are what's called underinsured. And the biggest source or cause of bankruptcies in this country is medical bills. I think that health care is a human right, and we have waited far too long in the United States to solve a problem that every other industrialized country um, has solved many years ago. So I absolutely support Medicare for All. What does that mean, though? That means taking a program like Medicare, which works very, very well right now for senior citizens, and making it better and bringing everybody in this country into that plan. And as part of that, we will not only reduce cost overall for the system, but we will make sure that we improve quality of care for everybody across this country. And it would um, be in lieu of a private insurance system, which I do not believe has worked well uh, for, uh, for Americans. I'd be proud to fight for that progressive vision. It's the same bill that our Congressman Pete Visklosky co-sponsors right now in the House of Representatives. And I look forward to uh, voting for it and supporting it um, when I'm in Congress. Mr. Bergeron, this is a question uh, from student Olivia Capos. She asks, due to your experience as a corrections officer, what would be the main issue in prisons you would try to change? Our prisons suck. That's just the reality of it. I worked there for seven years. Um, most Republican, I am a Republican, by the way, I forgot to mention that, but most Republicans are in favor of privatization. I am not. Privatization destroys what we try to create. The 
Indiana State Prison, I started right after they started Aramark, right? Aramark took over the food service. I wouldn't serve that stuff to my dog. It is absolutely atrocious, and privatization needs to be gone. That said, we need to focus on rehabilitation. We're locking people up and saying, okay, see, in a few years, we're not teaching them how to go out and get a job. We're not teaching them how to integrate back in society. We're not changing the behavior that made them get there in the first place, which is why recidivism rates are so high. The medical care, again, atrocious because it's privatized. We need equal justice in this country. If you have money, don't worry about it. You won't go to jail. I'm sure you've seen many, many examples of this all over the news. Epstein is a prime example. Money <clears throat> equals freedom. Our pri uh, public defenders are overwhelmed, vastly underpaid, and unfortunately they have to do the things the way they do it. They push for plea agreements, for the prosecutors do, in order to speed things up. Our legal system is completely overwhelmed. I would focus on rehabilitation and stopping what's creating this, which is equal justice. Get some of these people that are committing these crimes that have plenty of money, get them in jail. I guarantee you it'll change their uh, behavior after a little bit of time and with the regular folk. Thank you. It's, it's a good case. Mr. Costello, what is your approach to making college more affordable for the high school seniors who will be going to college next year? Thank you. Just to start, you visit my website, scottcostello.org. You could read more. I have a lot of uh, detailed information on that site, on policies that I've written. Um, to start with, I am for public education through grade 18. One of the reasons why it's grade 18 and that, that would include junior colleges and trade schools is because automation is going to kill our economy. So globalization was the first big blow and uh, automation is going to probably take away 50% of the jobs that we have today by 2050. So if you don't have an advanced degree, you will not be able to step foot in the workplace. And that is no joke. And it's starting to happen now where our current manufacturing uh, industry is a million, can't fill a million jobs because as it has become more advanced, people can't get into, the, uh, into those jobs. So we're already having a workforce shortage in that area. So one thing I would do is fund public, uh, public education through 18. Uh, and I would also expand Pell Grants. People need to go to college, and they need to usually live at college and have food and everything else. We need to have Pell Grants to pay for textbooks and all that other stuff. I also believe that with the Green New Deal, it includes affordable housing. And I think college students need affordable housing. So we need massive amounts of affordable housing for all different types of uh, segments of our economy, from homelessness to college students and so on. Ms. Borum, as you stated, you serve on the board of directors for North Shore Health Centers. Do you support a public or private option so that individuals can buy into Medicare? So I would like, oh, thank you. <laughs> so I would like to merge the two. I think that there is a way to expand and improve ACA, which is the Affordable Care Act. I think that we need to, um, uh, improve funding for Medicare and Medicaid, and we need to empower them to negotiate drug prices. We need to um, make sure that we are able to uh, have uh, health care services without surprise bills so that families are not going bankrupt. And I, we definitely do that at uh, North Shore Health Centers. I think we need to expand FHQs, which are uh, federal, federal qualified health centers, so that we can um, be more accessible in the community. It's really hard for community members to go to hospitals and receive the treatment that they need. I think it's more accessible and more friendly to have a community health center in the community um, that it is serving so that it creates a more friendly environment and you know that they care. So I definitely would merge the two. Mr. Farrar, considering the recent U.S. outbreak of the coronavirus, do you think the government is taking enough steps to protect the American public? And if not, where do we need to improve? Uh, to me, the answer to that is probably not. Um, 
my now, there is a reasonable chance that. Grab another one. Just put it back. Grab this one. Right, Come on. Break this hand. So, as I was saying, uh, probably not. Uh, there's a reasonable chance that uh, coronavirus isn't going to hit the United States of America as hard as it seems to be hitting other countries such as China, Italy. Um, but from what I understand, there's states where we don't even have proper testing kits. Uh, I heard there wasn't any testing kits in the state of Indiana just a few days ago. So how would we even know if anybody has coronavirus? We don't even have the ability to test for it. Um, to me, the answer the ultimate answer to the question, to the problem, the solution to the problem, is uh, Medicare for all. Uh, once we provide and guarantee everybody access to health care as a human right, when you think you're sick, you have the ability to go to a doctor without worrying about accumulating a huge debt. Um, so, like I said, I believe health care as a human right. Uh, everybody should have access. And if we had that in place, then I would be able to say yes. We have everything in place that we're ready for coronavirus. Right now, we have millions of people who don't have access to health insurance. They, if they can contract coronavirus, they're still going to go to work. They're going to potentially infect hundreds of people who might go out and infect hundreds more. Okay? The reality is, considering how contagious coronavirus is, the genie might already be out of the bottle. It might just be a matter of time until it hits us. So to me, we got to do more. I will fight to do more as your congressman. Thank you. Our next question for Ms. Haig uh, comes from Gianna Galante, and she will read her question. Given that you are a Gary investor and attorney, in light of the hardships of the public education system in underserved communities in Northwest Indiana, what are your ideas for improving the educational opportunities for the underprivileged? Thanks, Gianna. I mentioned earlier that I've been a lawyer in downtown Chicago for 26 years. I didn't mention that as a trial lawyer, the last half of that, my bread and butter client, I, I, I have my own firm. I don't work for anyone, I work for myself. My big bread and butter client for the last 10 years has been the Chicago Board of Education. So I have a different insight into public education than probably most people. I actually get to litigate constitutional law. But every three years, well-meaning people come up with a new acronym to try to fix the public education system. We've had No Child Left Behind, I Step, I Learn, you name it. There's always a new acronym. And at the end of the day, kids in certain suburbs and certain communities are having achievement levels that kids in the inner city schools can't meet. Why is that? I have a different perspective on why that is. I don't think it has anything to do with money. I think it has to do with trauma in the home. I know that because I came from that home. I, met, I alluded a little bit to my past. Well, it's worse than that. I won't go into details. We had nonstop domestic violence and substance abuse. My siblings did not make it, and I mentioned that. I believe that if we start identifying these kids early on, when we get them in the door, and start identifying the kids that are coming from trauma, we can close that education gap. Because it's not just the kids who are misbehaving in the classroom. When that kid misbehaves, the teacher takes away her or his instructional time and deals with that child who's misbehaving. That means if they're spending 30% of their instructional time trying to deal with the, the kids who come from trauma, the rest of the kids in the class, their scores suffer. I believe that the reason we have this huge in, um, educational performance gap is that we're not identifying trauma in the home. Having come from that home, I can tell you, I know, if you come from that kind of background, you can't sit in a classroom and conjugate verbs and learn algebra. It just doesn't wash. So I think if we identify these kids, I think that's what we've been doing wrong, and I think that's how we will help these inner city kids. Thanks. Mayor McDermott. Considering the high number of gun shows in Indiana, do you support ending the gun show loophole and requiring universal background checks? Thank you. Thanks for the question. You know, for us to be able to enact these great policies we're talking about, we have to be able to win. That's important, obviously. And one thing the Republican Party has been very good at labeling the Democratic Party over is, this is the party who wants to come and take your guns. And that's a non-starter for a lot of people. In this audience, your parents who may carry guns or may believe in the Second Amendment, that's why when I answer this question, I answer it a little bit different. Because I do believe in the Second Amendment, and I am a Democrat, proud Democrat. I have a lifetime permit from the state of Indiana to carry a gun, actually. I'm not carrying now because if we're in a school, obviously. I'm not carrying my car because my car is in the parking lot. But I do carry it for personal protection. However, 
We do live in the era of mass shootings. We do live in the era where people die on our streets far too often, especially in our district, a lot of them in my city. That's why I do oppose assault weapons. Those are offensive weapons meant to kill other people. Our soldiers use those weapons. I don't think they need to be used on the streets of Hammond, East Chicago, Gary, or any of our first congressional district. I, I support the red flag laws. We were able to take weapons from people that are a harm to themselves or their community. I believe in strengthening universal background checks. And like I said earlier, I believe assault weapons have no place on our streets. So even though I do support the Second Amendment, and I'm not the type of Democrat that's coming to take your guns, I do think I'm an effective person that can negotiate with the other party and try to tighten up these way too lax gun laws we have in our country. It's a major problem in our country, and I think all of us reasonable people know that. Thank you very much for the question. Our next question comes from Dylan Hillsley, if he's in the audience. Uh, if not, then I will proceed to read his question. Uh, he asks, with Indiana having some of the worst air pollution in the United States, what would you do to help minimize that? This question is for Mr. Hadley. Well, I want to thank Dylan for the question first, and also for this forum. So I have a criticism for a university that I work for right now. We're building a brand new building on campus, and we should be the leader in Northwest Indiana. We're building a building that's not LEED certified. This is something that's been going on around the country for 20 years. It's why I left this region to go work in Pittsburgh at the world's largest LEED certified convention center. These are the types of activities that will help clean up our air and water. If you're reducing the amount of energy that you're consuming, you're going to be putting less emissions into the air. That's a simple mathematical formula. Secondly, we just recently tr tr uh, transitioned from burning oil at the steel mills to natural gas. That's going to help clean up our air as well in this area. Has anybody ever heard of uh, the organization called the Center for Innovation Through Visualization S Simulation by hands? Anybody? No? So it's an it's a institution at Purdue Northwest that I believe is going to be a leader for a federal laboratory that I'd like to see established at Purdue Northwest. Center for Innovation Through Visualization Simulation allows us to take a look at steel mills and makes them more efficient in simulation so that the steel industry can actually start to be more efficient as far as the energy they use. Finally, I am a strong advocate for automated manufacturing. And if, if we see it, um, a growth of automated manufacturing in Northwest Indiana, I would hope that they would be built in LEED certified buildings. That's my answer. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mosby, with the 2020 census this year, states across the nation will have to redraw district lines. Do you support nonpartisan commissions in charge of redrawing districts? Uh, uh, redistricting has suffocated our democracy. Whether you live in, whether it's a red state or a blue state, they have pretty much, who's ever, whoever's in a majority can draw a map to favor their party. And I think that it, is, it, it suffocates the voice of, of ordinary Americans that want their voice to be heard. And I think that I do support an independent commission uh, driven by citizens. And I think that it, we, uh, it, that would create more of a, a dialogue between uh, individuals, for example, what we have now is you have the extreme left and extreme right. And it shouldn't be like that. We should be able to come together and we can agree to disagree. I mean, I went to Iowa State and my best friend is a farmer. I mean, we, had, we came from different walks of life and I, they've supported my campaign. And I'm pretty sure they voted for Trump. You know, but that doesn't mean that we're, we're all human and I think that we need to find common ground and I think uh, having an independent commission to draw the maps would, would make it more uh, uh, will create a, a more healthier dialogue and discourse in this country. Thank you. Mr. Murban, steel is the backbone of Northwest Indiana economy. How would you support steel mills considering the Trump administration's steel tariffs due to the steel dumping? So first and foremost, uh, it's a steel industry question. And so I want to ask very quickly, how many of you have parents that or 
involved with the steel industry. Okay. So I've been endorsed by the United Steel Workers Association. There are 7,000 active and retired regions in the first district. My grandfather worked at Inland Steel at the steel industry for 54 years. It's the backbone of our economy. So the tariffs, what had happened, I want to explain this to you. There are foreign countries, China, Vietnam, South Korea, and what they do is they subsidize their products. So they're making something or manufacturing it. And what the government does is they pay, for example, the utility bill to make it cheaper to be able to make that product. Then what they do is they dump that product into the United States and into the global market, and it drives down the cost of our products that are being made. What everyone here needs to know is that we are the top producing state in the nation for steel. So it's a priority. Secondly, President Trump declared it a national security to make sure we protect our steel industry. Because our steel goes to the armed forces that are building ships, that are building tanks, that are building airplanes, aircraft carriers. And so when he did that, he put tariffs on the steel. And in the beginning, that was great because we started ramping up a lot of steel. Then the global market came down. So what I'm going to do as your congressman is make sure that we have trade laws that protects our, our borders from those products coming into our country so that we don't have job loss. Because when you have an after effect of that, your product comes in and you lose jobs, then people have to be able to be retrained. We want to be able to stop the products from coming in and protect our steel industry. Thank you very much. Mr. Harper, this question comes from student Kate Nevers. She asks, how do you intend to address the concern regarding the state minimum wage, especially considering the raises that most other states have implemented? Uh, that is a very good question. One of the things that drove me to run for this office is because I believe that the economy in this country is rigged against most Americans. I think it's rigged against, frankly, far too often this generation as well. It is inexcusable that Indiana has not raised our minimum wage or that the federal government has not raised its minimum wage in several years. So I'm proud to support a whole host of policies that I think will support and promote economic fairness in this country. The first one is we need a $15 minimum wage. Localities, states around the country have done it. It has worked. It has helped the middle class. And because Indiana is not acting, I would support it at the federal level. We also need to support and vote for, and I would advocate for, other policies in Congress that will promote economic fairness in this country. One of those things is that we need paid family leave so that if an employee is becomes ill, becomes pregnant, a spouse becomes pregnant, whatever it may be, that they can not only take time off work, but that that time is paid so that they can spend time with their family, their relatives, their loved ones, um, and we can promote uh, 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 strong families in that way. I also think that we need to end what is a fundamental unfairness in this state, which is the fact that in Indiana, it remains legal. It remains legal in Indiana to discriminate against somebody because of their sexual orientation or because of their gender identity. And that's why I would support policies at the federal level, like the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, to make sure that it is illegal everywhere in this country to discriminate against somebody because of who they are or who they love. Mr. Bergeron, this question comes from student Gabriel Siebold. He asks, given your experience as an OTR truck driver, what steps would you take to prevent federal interference in union operations and rights? Uh, OK, so basically what you have is you have the people who believe that Republicans just hate unions and Democrats love unions. That seems to be the going theory, that, that Republicans are pro-business and Democrats are pro-workers. The thing is, is it's a symbiotic relationship. Businesses need workers like workers need business. Uh, anytime you have more government control of anything, I think we can all agree we see problems. Um, basically, what it comes down to is the Democrat Party wants more government. The Republican Party wants less government. This includes on union and federal oversight of union. I'd like to see a rollback. I'd like to see people be able to go and join together. Right now, companies like Amazon are protected from stopping people from making unions. Um, there's company propaganda that has come out and become public that shows they're anti-union. 
we need to roll back the federal government, not increase it. Thank you. Mr. Costello, this question comes from student Liam Hopkins. He asks, given your 20 plus year experience in social work, how would you use or change the budget regarding social services for veterans? That's three years, actually, just to clarify. <laughs> so again, go to scottcostello.org. You can read a lot more about my policies there. Uh, I will say I've worked with veterans for a long time in just about every place you can work with veterans. Uh, residential, or emergency rooms, private practice, and so on. My father was a World War II veteran, had a cousin who was a three-star general under Bill Clinton in the Joint Chiefs of Staff, had another cousin who was uh, an Army Ranger. I know veterans really well. Um, about 50% of the suicides in our country are veterans, about 30 people a day, 30 veterans a day. More veterans committed suicide who served in Vietnam than died in Vietnam. So this is an extremely serious problem. Veterans need a ton of support. They need housing that's affordable and guaranteed. They need a jobs guarantee. They need um, not just medications, they need psychotherapy. You know, we have a tendency to just give people pills, pills, and they need psychotherapy, long-term psychotherapy, and support groups. So there's a lot that veterans need that we aren't providing for them. Medicare for all would cover the substance abuse treatment, the, the other types of treatment that are not, that not all veterans get. Veteran health care is extremely complicated. And depending on when, where you served, and if you were in the war or not, and that kind of thing, it's way too complicated. Medicare for all could simplify that whole process for veterans. I see veterans all the time who are like tired of dealing with the VA and they, because of the complexity of it. So Medicare for all can help uh, provide veterans a lot of treatment as well. Thank you. Our next question is for Ms. Borum and comes from senior Eric Ailes. If we could get him the microphone. Give me a plan as a teacher. How are you going to raise the wages for teachers? And do you as well the worst paying teachers? And I would like to know your thoughts. So, um, does everybody know how a bill becomes policy or law? We all know that. <laughs> so, a part of it is the appropriations, right? This is an appropriations bill. Um, until Democrats had taken over the majority, Labor HHS, which includes education, has, had not received a hearing on the House floor under Republican leadership. That's a problem. Those are the social services, that's education, all wrapped into one. It would go into one omnibus bill at the end and it would just go through. That's how states receive their funding in addition to their own funding. So we need to talk about what the state is doing with the funding they're receiving, how to increase funding. Being an appropriator, working for the Appropriations Committee, and also being supported or working with over 75 congressional members, that's what we need to get bills and legislation passed. So we have to be able to have the relationships to get it passed, increase funding, work with state, legislat uh, state legislatures and the governor to make sure that this is a priority. Earlier last year, uh, the teachers went red for ed, and it was amazing the response that the legislature took on education. Those are the type of organization, organizational things that we need to do to make sure that our legislators, our representatives know that it is important to us. Thank you. Mr. Farrar, this question comes from an anonymous junior. They ask, the rise of mental health issues is increasing here in Indiana. How do you hope to support people with mental health issues? Well, I've, uh, unfortunately, uh, I've known a lot of people with mental health issues throughout my life. Uh, my birth mother actually was not fit to take care of me, and I, that's why I was adopted. And I was fortunate to be adopted by a wonderful family. Uh, 
as a teacher, I worked in middle school special education and I had students who had their own mental health struggles. Uh, and then uh, later on, I went to work for the Indiana State Department of Child Services, where I worked with both children, youth, and their parents who often had their own mental health issues, a lot of times substance abuse issues as well. A lot of times those things can go hand in hand. Uh, and a lot of times also you throw trauma into the mix as either a contributing cause or something that stems uh, from a root cause. Um, so what I realize is the ultimate solution is the same solution to the last question, actually, because uh, a Medicare for all universal single payer health care system, uh, such as Bernie Sanders has proposed, will cover mental health needs. It will cover vision, it will cover dental, um, and it will give that uh, coverage and care to every single American as a human right. Um, so that's what I support as the solution. I also think as a society, though, we have to uh, reach out to people and, and eliminate the stigma of accepting that maybe we do need help with our mental health. A lot of times people come out and talk about that uh, and they get treated like they're not normal. They get treated like lesser. Job opportunities dry up. You know, nobody wants to work with the crazy person. Uh, we need to accept that many of us, uh, perhaps undiagnosed, have our own mental health struggles. Uh, a lot of us deal with depression. Many people are bipolar, and they're not getting the help and the treatment that they need. So not only do we need to make the services and treatment available to them, but we need to, as a society, be more caring and more understanding so that those people can feel free to reach out for the help that they need. Thanks. Ms. Hake, this question comes from senior Maddie Fig. If she's in the auditorium, then I will proceed to read her question. She asks, given your background in environmentalism, how do you plan to transform Northwest Indiana's economy with renewable energy? Thanks for that question. Uh, climate change is my passion. That is why I decided to run for Congress. Uh, the Green New Deal took its name from the New Deal, one of the most transformative periods in our nation's economic history. If we are serious about keeping our temperature from rising two more degrees, which scientists tell us will be irreversible, we have got to kick it over into overdrive immediately. And the cool thing is that this will be the best thing that Northwest Indiana's economy has ever seen, including steel. And I have a specific idea. I, I would like to piggyback on Frank's idea. My idea is to ban dirty steel from the countries that make uh, stronger carbon emissions by making the same product. This is going to come. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And he liked, Congressman Visklowski took that idea back to the WTO, and that may actually get implemented regardless of who gets elected. So that's a very cool thing. The other thing is that the CNI sector, the uh, commercial and in, in industrial sector, has told this Republican administration that if they would allow more access to renewable energy, we would expand our jobs tenfold. We could be making steel turbines. We've got a port right next to steel with land and a workforce. We should be making wind turbines. Wind is a $1 trillion industry. As of 2030, it's going to hit the $1 trillion mark. That's huge. Why aren't we making those? We could quadruple our, our steel mill jobs as long as we make it with re, uh, renewable steel. We also have the capacity now to make an all solar steel component. It would have to be an assembly line. But we could do this with solar power. We don't have to keep dirtying our atmosphere to make steel. Another one is construction jobs. If we expand into wind and solar, the, the reports are all over the board. Tens of thousands of jobs just by going green. So it's the Green New Deal kind of um, on, pumped up on steroids for the Northwest Indiana economy. Please check it out. Go Sabrina.com. I also have a renewable energy poll on my website. Please check it out. I'm going to ask Sid to, to distribute it too. My name's not on it. It's not political. We just want to get your opinion Thank on you, renewable Ms. energy. Thanks. Mayor McDermott, this question comes from Ariana Bayless. She says, my mother has always worked hard to provide for us. When my parents were married, we got free lunch. However, as soon as she became single, we were refused free lunch and food stamps because she no longer provided for five people, but four. However, since the divorce, her income has been more demanding. How do you respond? This question strikes a chord with me. Um, when I was a kid going to elementary school, actually when I was a baby, my parents divorced before I even knew they were together. My father lived in Hammond, Indiana. My mom and me uh, lived in Napa, California. 
And for a large period of time in my childhood, I grew up in a home with just my mom and my sister and I. And we were barely on the edge, a lot. And I knew there was a difference between, you know, the kids that showed up to school and had their lunches paid for by their parents and, and myself, for instance, I had to show up at school back then with something was called a lunch ticket. Everybody knew what the lunch ticket was, though. I had to go up. If I wanted lunch, I had to hand it to the lunch person, and they gave me lunch for free because we qualified for this program. And I was appreciative for the program, but at the same time, there was a stigma associated with kids like me. Not only did my dad live across the country, I was also barely on the edge with my mom. So getting this question strikes a chord with me. I support these programs wholeheartedly. I'm the mayor of Hammond, Indiana. Over half our kids, actually probably closer to three quarters of our kids in our city, are on free and reduced lunch programs. So this is an important program. It should, and I support it, and I will support it if I become your congressman. It should be based on income, realistic income, and it also should have no stigma attached so that when the kid goes up to get their lunch, like I had to, I didn't have to hold my head down and hand the free lunch ticket over to the person because I don't believe in that either. So I appreciate this question very much. I support this, and if I'm given a chance to be your congressman, I'm going to support it in Washington, D.C. as well. Thank you very much. This next question is for Mr. Hadley and comes from senior Tristan Toon. If he's in the audience, he can take the microphone. Uh, hello, my name is Tristan Toon. I recently joined the United States Army. A lot of veterans have PTSD and about 5,000 take their lives every year. What would you do to help veterans with their mental health issues? And is there any benefits you would help with in general? Tristan, I want to first start off by saying thank you. I'm sure everybody on this panel would thank you for your future service. And I also want to thank all the students for participating in these questions. These are tough questions. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to start by telling you about a year ago today, uh, President Trump issued an executive order about this very issue about um, veteran suicides. They've been studying it. They've been pulling together various groups around the country, and we're awaiting a report on either this afternoon or tomorrow morning that will issue new policy for how to deal with uh, veteran suicides, which is actually 22 a day. It, it is a major crisis. I, I want, I, I actually had a moment of refreshment here, um, having a Democrat admit that the VA is a mess. So that's 3% of our demographic pool in the United States. 3%. And they can't make that work. And people are already talking about Medicare for all or single payer. They're talking about 100% government funded health care. And they've admitted they cannot take care of 3%. It's a tragedy, totally a tragedy. I had experience with this personally. Had a young friend in Pittsburgh who was a Marine, eight-year Marine, had a, a daughter that was a year year old, and he committed suicide. This is an issue that needs more study and I'm looking for more direction from the executive level. Um, but personally, I think there's some very successful peer-to-peer -peer studies going on at the Pittsburgh VA right now. Thank you for your time. This question is for Mr. Mosby and comes from Mia Baker. If she's in the audience, she can take the microphone. All right, then I'll proceed to read her question. She says, lots of drugs go through Northwest Indiana. So how would you vote on enforcing drug restrictions such as heroin, cocaine, et cetera? Well, I'd like to thank Mia for the question. And if you see her tomorrow, so I thank her. And so I think that there's uh, plenty of laws uh, that help to enforce uh, drugs, drug trafficking. But as a congressman, we have two jobs. One is to legislate and appropriate. And so as a congressman, I would definitely make sure that I would uh, appropriate the necessary funding so that our local, state, and county uh, uh, law enforcement officials could do their job to the best of their ability. 
and I walk in Portage and I, I continually see trucks and other individuals pulled over on the side of the roads, knowing that these traffic stops are happening and that when I read the Times that there was a drug, there was a large amount of drugs, uh, uh, narcotics uh, confiscated. And so, but I, will, I think that we've done way too much as far as penalizing people on drugs. And we, Joe Biden's running for office, and Joe Biden was the author of the 1994 crime bill, which uh, accelerated the rate of prison populations and affected the communities in which I come from, African American communities, uh, drastically. I think that in this district, we have over 60,000 residents that uh, and live at poverty or below the poverty level. And I think that we need to focus on economic opportunities as to why some people wouldn't have to resort to that. When I was a teenager, we didn't look at, okay, can I go work at McDonald's? We was like, oh, we can go sell drugs as a way it means to take care of ourselves. And so I think that we need to make sure that we have the economic opportunities for all so that uh, drugs is not the, is a way to people look for the profit. Thank you. This last question is for Mr. Mervan and comes again from student Kate Nevers. She asks, how do you plan to combat the erosion affecting the Lake Michigan shoreline? So uh, I represent Hammond White East called the Highland and Monster. In 2008, there was a very large flood. And that flood caused a disaster. So we have erosion of the lake shore, Lake Michigan. And what I would like to do is kind of mimic what we did there by putting together a state and federal commission to be able to understand and be able to protect the homes and the buildings that are along the lakeshore. So what we all need to understand are the Indiana dunes, not only for Chesterton, but for Hammond, where I live, is a place of recreation where people want to go. And the fact of the matter is, is why there's a lot of property damage if you want people to speak the truth to you, is because when you build as close as you possibly can to the lakeshore, and then the lake holds more water in a cycle than it usually does, then you have erosion because it's a natural cycle. So we've got to be able to figure out that property owners that are going to live as close as they possibly want to the lake shore, there's got to be a gap. But there is a thing called the Army Corps of Engineers that develops from the national side to be able to protect it. The state of Illinois, the governor, created a disaster. Governor of Indiana, Governor Holcomb, is soon to come to the lake shore area and the dunes be able to talk about it. So what I want to pivot from that is you create a commission, you have the Army Corps of Engineers as your congressman, you include them, you put federal funds to be able to protect it, and you also understand that the environment is extremely important. When it comes to the environment, when Sid was at the local action blitz in Highland, I understand the path or the burden that your generation has with climate change. So you've got to be able to pass legislation, you've got to be able to create seats at the table for people like yourselves, who are interested in the environment and making sure that climate change is a priority. So when we tie all those things together, we work together and we're able to find solutions. Thank you. That concludes the question and answer session, as well as the Chesterton High School Congressional Candidate Forum hosted by the Social Studies Department. Thank you to our congressional candidates for recognizing the importance of the youth vote and for educating us today. We will now be open to a meet and greet part, uh, portion of the forum. Please feel free to come and ask any questions that you personally have or to introduce yourselves to the candidates at the front of the auditorium.